Buffalo. Buffalo. Welcome, everybody. Welcome on the live stream and welcome here in San Francisco to the final. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> HCMFR. Welcome to the final uh, HTML5 game programming study group. It's uh, it's hard to believe that it's already the, yeah, the last right. one, right? It's, it's, it's time been is two flying. Months. Two months. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's been a pretty uh, a fun ride for us and yeah. for all of you, hopefully, in the room. Uh, it's been helpful as well. Uh, so with me, I have Colt McKenless, Hello. developer advocate, Google, Sean Bennett, Howdy. of course, architect at Udacity, and I'm Peter Lovers, program manager at Google. So before we dive into the final uh, study group, I just wanted to um, say thanks to all the, the sponsors that we've had uh, for the last eight weeks. Mm. Uh, first of all, uh, Google for providing this great venue and the food, which uh, it's been oh, eight those nachos. great meals. Yeah. Right. The nachos. The nachos. Was nachos. Is this oh, the best man. one? Oh. <laughs> right. okay. That's hard. It's yeah, hard to call. Right. Yeah. So uh, round of applause for, for Google. Yeah. That was a little delayed because everyone was too busy enjoying <laughs> too the be food busy, in the yeah. venue. Yeah. Speaking of which, if you're still eating, if you can take your plate afterwards to the little trays at the back, that would be yeah. fantastic. Um, also, I wanted to thank uh, the San Francisco HTML5 user group. Uh, a lot of you have signed up or have heard about this course f uh, through them. And um, one of the upcoming events uh, that's not an HTML5 user group event, but a, a public event that we're also um, telling everyone about is the O'Reilly Fluent Conference. So that uh, schedule is up. If you go to our SFHTML5 page, you can find the coupon code SFHTML20. It's 20% 20 off the Fluent Conference. So definitely use that code to sign up. Uh, also, wanted to let you know that the Velocity Conference is back in Santa Clara. And that's yeah. going to be at the end of that's June. And stuff. you'll find um, some great performance talks. Uh, Colt will be there yep, with I'll a special there. showcase. So it's going to be a, a couple of great conferences. So Fluent in San Francisco and Velocity in Santa Clara. I uh, also wanted to thank the Google Developers Live uh, network. This is where we broadcast a lot of our live shows that you're probably aware of. Uh, things like The Breakpoint with Paul Irish and Adi Osmani, uh, Chrome Apps, uh, Office Hours. A mobile show. We have uh, launched a, f a few new shows this year. So definitely check that out and you can filter that by the technology that you're interested in. So we have shows on Android and Chrome and Maps and a variety of things that you can uh, check out. So great stuff. Uh, as soon as these shows that are live are done, they become uh, recordings. So they're recorded in, in the YouTube backend almost instantly so you can play them anytime in any time zone. All right. So <laughs> All right. There you go. Yeah, and Google Developers Live set up the mobile studio that we're actually broadcasting from right yeah. now. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. And, and these guys over here. These guys over here. Yeah. Broadcast rock yeah. stars. Right? Rock stars. Rock stars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's heavy. More and more. <laughs> it takes four Peter Lubbers to haul to the car. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I brought my kids. Yeah. <laughs> so we have some uh, some special guests in the audience, uh, not from very far this time, but we have, of course, uh, a regular now, Colt's dad. <laughs> Their dad. <laughs> and I brought my kids along, um, Rocky and Sean over in the front. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so really, again, the only reason we brought these people was to help us lug around the mobile video setup. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Hidden uh, ulterior motives. Uh -huh. Oh, oh yeah. That's right. Oh, okay. We have the another. <laughs> well, again, right. Great. So tonight, uh, questions about the final unit but also questions about anything else. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're interested in any other question, or if you want to ask any other questions, please do so. Uh, on our website, on the YouTube channel, we have listed the uh, URL, the moderator URL, that's also in the study group pages on Udacity website. Um, before we dive into it any further, with a little uh, story time with Colt again, uh, Sean, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the the contest that we're running in parallel. Yeah, so the contest, uh, is, as all of you know, is to build uh, your own web game, basically. As if it runs in a browser, then it counts, <laughs> you know? And we've had already some pretty cool submissions. Um, 
I've I've seen a lot of really good ones. I are don't want to. Are there any favorites? Are you allowed to? I, are you allowed to play favorites? I, I don't really want to do that <laughs> no? quite okay. yet. All right. Uh, but yeah, I I found myself wasting a few minutes. <laughs> a few minutes earlier today, <laughs> more more than a few minutes, uh, because right. there were a number of very good ones. So, to okay. all of you who have submitted uh, contest entries, well done. Seriously, I've, I'm already really enjoying them, and we passed them around the office, and I think it wasted a lot of productivity. 15,000 man hours were wasted yeah. today. So <laughs> playing, congratulations. Playing contest entries I guess. is fantastic. <laughs> what, what I really find uh, inspiring about it is that a lot of these individuals, when the course started, were, were very much to the point yeah. that they were like, we, we know nothing about game development mm -hmm. and we're really not that good at HTML5. Mm -hmm. And then getting submissions from them that have unique gameplay mm -hmm. that's depth and, and creates a different sense mm -hmm. of, of what you're trying to do in the design and the elements. It's really inspiring to see what people have been able to do in the short amount of time mm -hmm. and Absolutely. the data provided. It's, it's humbling, yeah. really, to see what the students have done. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a few submissions for people who really didn't have any programming experience yeah. and just kind of pushed forward <laughs> through it. And a lot of those entries are really unique, like mm -hmm. different gameplay elements that I just would not have thought of yeah. that are novel and very, very interesting. That's, I'm, that's I'm why really, you weren't allowed to enter the contest. That's why I was not allowed <laughs> to enter the contest. My imagination is not there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we've had some great uh, entries. Uh, so I sent out an email uh, earlier today saying that the end of the contest was uh, later tonight, basically. And but. Peter and I were just talking about it. And you don't we, we, <laughs> we, we want to see what more you guys can do. So we decided to extend it by another week. Just, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> I, I know there are a number of people that were very, very close. Yeah, very right. close, and we're pushing hard for that. Yeah. So, so let's see, if, let's see what you guys week, can do. Uh, we'll update it on the website. Yep. So and that's next Monday. Yep, that is next Monday, midnight uh, Pacific time. Right. Just to be clear. For uh, those we'll, of you in Hawaii, that does yeah. not. <laughs> yep. So make sure you're in the right time right. zone. <clears throat> But yeah, okay. I, I can't wait to see all the all the additional submissions. I've already had a blast playing all your games. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's been great. So okay, so you have a little bit extra time to get those final contest entries in. Uh, again, what you're going up for is uh, a, a extra ticket for Google I/O. Um, also, a cameo appearance in one of the future Udacity training courses, and then a variety of Chromebooks and Nexus Seven tablets. So. Uh, good stuff for almost any, any from the different categories. So check it out on our website. It's part of the Udacity HTML5 game development uh, wiki. So just mm -hmm. find all the information there. Yep. Okay, so I uh, wanted to open it up for questions, but before we do that, uh, we have that's now become our uh, like a weekly bit tradition. Of a I guess. tradition. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a tradition. It's time really? for. Story sure time with Colt. Yes. Yeah. yes. Come on, hashtag. Guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the hashtag for that is story time. Story time, time with Colt. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually been seeing it pop up on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, I've couple seen a few of them. Trying yeah, tonight. It was <laughs> really. He, he put in story, and one of the yeah, options was yeah. story time with Colt. Really? Yeah. Wow. Seriously. <laughs> well, I am. I got to come up with better stories now. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, this is dead, right? This one. Yeah, it's there. Okay, fantastic. Hit it all you want. Yeah, because I end up <laughs> smacking as I'm doing stuff. Fantastic. So uh, thank you all once again for allowing me to stand up here and ramble uh, for about 10, 15 minutes over additional data that we find very useful to the course itself. Now, this week was asset managing and loading of content. So hopefully everyone uh, saw the unit and thought it was very useful and informative. Uh, what I want to talk about today is sort of a long-winded explanation about why asset management and loading is probably the most difficult and important problem for you to face in video games because after even after you've gotten someone buying your game it's the playing of the game that can actually influence negatively other users right so someone buys your game and they're like cool they've already given you your 60 bucks or your buck 99 or whatever but it's what they tell their friends afterwards about the product that loses your social um, and your viral setup to buy more of the games and that all comes from load time and runtime performance so uh, first off who's played Mass Effect some gamers in the audience. I like Anne's hand went up. I like that. <laughs> well, we won't talk about the ending on 
Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, no, no. Yeah, that's, no. that's, no. that's, that's that, a different. That didn't happen. That's, that's a different. There, <laughs> it didn't end. It's a different comic. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Mass Effect was a, a very successful game on the Xbox 360 that came out. The first one did amazing, did gangbusters. Everyone loved it. Prompted a second one almost immediately. Uh, every, the team went right into development. The second one came out and was riddled with a number of problems. Probably the most obvious that many, many people actually decided to point out was actually their load times between levels. In fact, it was so bad that the pennyarcade.com uh, gaming website actually did a comic about it where they hypothesized that the entire population of an alien species died because they were simply waiting for these elevators to transition between eight feet between floors, right? Um, this is not what you want as a game developer, a publisher, or marketing, or any PR representative for a game, right? You don't want Penny Arcade coming out and bashing your game because of load times. Then, you know, the problem is there's like three engineers, they're like, oh, I could have fixed that, right? The main thing here is that when you look at some of these games, especially, let's just talk about console for a minute. When you look at some of these games, it all comes down to a basic graph like this, right? Where we're loading some data, we have to ask ourselves, are we done with this? Has everything been loaded? Has everything been processed? If not, go back and continue doing it. And while you're doing this under the hood, because most file I.O. operations reading off of the disk are blocking operations, you usually have that spawned off onto a separate thread, while your main thread is actually drawing some people on the screen doing, you know, standing in an elevator very awkwardly, right? And this is basically 90% percent of my experience on Mass Effect 2, right? It was just a bunch of people standing there like, oh, uh, yeah, how was those tacos today? Pretty good. All right. You know, again, this is not exactly what you want. It was for reasons like this that Xbox 360 actually came out with um, certification requirements that said in there that you're not allowed to actually have five seconds of a paused screen. Even if the user hits pause, you have to have something animating. Something has to be moving so the user knows that your game is alive, it's vibrant, and things are actually occurring. Most, mostly they actually put that in there for load times, so that while the game was loading, you just didn't see this crunky little loading bar at the bottom of the screen where you're just you know, waiting for data. It all came back to load times. Um, with the, uh, probably one of the most impressive things that I saw was actually from Half-Life 1. This is really one of the first games that I saw embrace this, this uh, different paradigm of loading. So anyone who's played Half-Life 1 or even Half-Life 2 knows that there was this great setup where you'd be running, some people would be chasing you, you got a dude with a crab on his head trying to claw his way at you, and then all of a sudden, for like an instant of a second, you would see this little loading icon on the screen, right? And then it would disappear. And then all of a sudden you can just keep running, keep running, keep running. Then, you know, 30, 45 minutes later, you'd see that little loading icon again, and then it'd disappear. The interesting thing was that the guys who were writing this code knew that load times were a problem. The maps in Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 were actually a significant amount larger than any of the other game engines that existed at the time. And so they had to take loading into account. How they did this was actually pretty interesting. Well, not the crap guy. The crap guy didn't do anything. He just rambled around and crabbed at people. Um, so how they did this was, if you're looking at sort of a map from a top-down perspective, you can see that we have some hallway geometry, and when a user is running through the hallway, they'd actually put a little physics object in there, much like we saw with the physics unit, that did nothing except have a collision callback, right? So when the user tramps on this uh, wall tile or some, some body in space, what it would do is actually trigger off to the engine, it would actually start loading the next level. Here is the cool part. If anyone who's played those games think back, you'll always notice that there was some spot in the game where you were like, I'm running for like three minutes and like nothing's going on. It's just like a hallway and a left turn. I gotta go up these stairs and jump over. There's no people, there's no life, you know, nothing going on. That's kind of what we saw here. The reason they did that was because when you hit that trigger point, they wanted to put enough interesting data in front of you while you're running around to let the next level load. It was actually pretty ingenious for the time, right? And then when the level would actually load, you couldn't tell because they basically duplicated the geometry. So to you, it just looked like a seamless experience running through. Of course, if you actually backed up and ran the other direction, you'd hit the same problem, right? Where they have to add all this extra geometry for you to run through and trigger the load again. This was actually a very uh, intuitive way to solve a difficult problem at the time. Right? Other games had solved these problems in different ways, mostly by saying loading, you get a little interesting screen, because back then, most of the people who played these games were hardcore programmer nerds, and you know, none of us really had anything better to do during the day. Sorry, I'll throw myself in that bucket too. <laughs> 
So this, uh, this type of methodology where you're actually going through what we call a dungeon crawler or a tunnel shooter works very well. Effectively, like we talked about last week, you have some sort of pre-computed visibility network for your entire map, right? And so you use some sort of binary space partition along with portals and visibilities to your leaf nodes. And you end up being able to say, hey, I'm in some hallway and that hallway can really only see the spiders that are trying to eat my head and, you know, 10 foot in front of me, right? This is actually a shot from Doom 3, probably one of the more modern tunnel uh, crawler games with uh, a lot of nice graphics. Doom 4, by the way, hopefully will get out the door one day soon. Um, the interesting thing about the screenshot is you really don't see far, right? You're kind of going from door to door to door to left turn to tunnel. You know, if you can actually see 15 to 100 feet in front of you, it actually kind of slows down in some of those older games because they were actually processing a lot more geometry. The reason I tell you this is because visibility determination and asset loading for some of these games that are only set up in this tunnel environment is very different than open world games. Games that actually have a horizon in them. Games that you can actually see up to like 50 nautical miles. Uh, this is actually a screenshot from one of the Crisis series. Uh, Crisis, if you haven't played it, a fantastic game where you, you play a badass dude who's stuck on an island trying to fight some other badass dudes. Uh, and basically there's a lot of trees in your way and you kind of have to solve that problem. <laughs> so, you know, you're not making left turns and right turns and stuff like that. You're like, ah, this bush is in, give me a machete for God's sake, right? Um, Crisis, by the way, fantastic engine, the Crytek engine, one of the first people to actually introduce the screen space ambient occlusion methodology, uh, which actually was implemented entirely for their foliage rendering, but added the sense of drop shadows and uh, soft shadowing to their environment where competing engines at the time weren't even thinking in a screen space methodology. They were still trying to say, solve the same problem in a world space. So so uh, the Crytek engine introduced that, and it's gone gangbusters since then. Like, if you, if you don't got SSAO, you know, you shouldn't be allowed in this club tonight, homie. Um, and then a <laughs> dance fight happens between programmers, and it's all crazy from there. Anyhow, uh, I, I mention all this because loading in some of these open world environments is very, very different. The algorithm has to be thought of in a completely different way, right? A user can actually spawn anywhere in the environment and look around them and see everything on the, in, on the island. So how do you prioritize load order? Because again, Remember, you're streaming data bits off of disk into RAM. And this has a certain amount of time that it takes, right? That hard disk has to spin up. You got to hit the head on that, get all the bits into memory, and the memory has to be processed into the CPU. This has an implicit time. So how we do this is actually a concept of, um, uh, what's, the, what's the right terminology? So we have a priority-based streaming system that at its core is actually based on uh, distance. So let's say we have a top-down environment here. So all of these little boxes represent some objects in an environment. And your user spawns at the X, okay? So the question is, you've just spawned. In what order should you load the assets in this environment so that you can get, to, you can get pixels to the screen as fast as possible and let the user start playing? with the assumption that you're not going to have everything loaded into the screen at once, right? Because it may be too much memory, you may have a streaming never-ending system. Well, the easiest thing here is to actually say, well, let's, let's sort everything in the environment by distance to the user, you know, add a priority to them, stick them in a queue, and just kind of let them spin up as the user walks around. You know, and this is fine because as the user spawns in another location, you can sort of use the same methodology for distance-based data. However, there's a little interesting hiccup in this when you actually start going down this path. Uh, see that larger box right there? Uh, what if that's the Eiffel Tower? And you can actually see that from your first location. So now you have a piece of geometry that's been added by artists that's actually visible from multiple locations, but actually would fail your distance test. Or better yet, what if you have uh, Mount Everest in the middle of it, too? It's visible from every location. So now you have to start asking yourself, well, how do we prioritize these large, influential prefab objects over our distance-based methodology? And what you end up with is a concept that sooner or later an artist is going to go in and have to type in some numbers into a file that actually puts loading priority, priority weights on the objects in the environment. So they would actually come in here and say, hey, Mount Everest is a one priority. You always have to load this asset first. So what happens is, um, over time, your artists start relying on the ability to, to author this loading chain more than your adaptive algorithm, right? Because artists and designers care very much about how the game is experienced from start to finish by your user, much less than programmers. We just kind of like the fact that the algorithm works and we didn't have to do too much work to do it. So most modern MMOs will actually solve this, right? Because so now, so now the problem is like, we end up with artists saying, hey, this has a load priority, but that may shift depending on where the user is in the environment, right? So if he's in the bottom X or the top X, you get a completely different load order. How most modern MMOs do this is they'll actually create for multiple spaces in the environment the exact location and what the load order is. 
and actually store these on disk. So when you actually load the game, it'll say, hey, what's my closest spawn point? Actually use the load order from that spawn point. And this will actually allow you to bump in, get your initial set of data, and then go from there. So in this setup, you can actually see that location A and location B are both prioritizing object ID 127, which is actually the Mount Everest object. And then from there, they actually have a variation on who loads what, right? So location A has uh, 1337 at the end of its list. Meanwhile, since we're closer to that object in location B, 1337 loads in earlier. So the interesting thing is most MMOs do this because you can just drop out of a game and drop in and come back later, right? So they actually use sort of this bucketized priority loading order in order to take care of that. Now, here's an interesting concept is uh, when you start adapting your game for streaming like this, where you try to get bits to the screen as fast as possible and allow the user to get into your game to start playing, you have to start asking yourself, well, how far can we really push this? Uh, my, one of my favorite examples of this is actually a game called World of Warcraft. Anyone familiar with that? It's a little niche. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Like, apparently Chuck Norris and Mr. T and Dave Chappelle play it. I don't know. Who are those guys? Anyhow. Um, a while ago, uh, World of Warcraft proposed an experiment, and internally at the company it was actually pretty radical. They wanted to make a version of World of Warcraft that was free and trial-based. So they made an initial game called TriWow. TriWow was an initial 25 megabyte download. Now, today World of Warcraft is somewhere on the order of like 40 gigs worth of data, right? You have to put in CD and CD and CD to install this stuff or, you know, let uh, Battle.net stream it to you over four day time on my internet connection. Um, so what these guys actually said is how can we get more users in the door without having to go through this barrier of 40 gigs of data getting transferred them? So they came up with TriWow. TriWow was, what if we could make a 25 meg initial download? That's all you had to download. And while you were sitting there, and basically the 25 meg was just your character creation screen. That was it. You know, you sign up for an account, you go and you go in there, you create your character, and you spend 10 minutes trying to figure out if you want Horde or Alliance or how many nose rings your goblin should have and all this other fun stuff. Meanwhile, while you're sitting around there playing, it's actually loading the rest of the 40 gigs in the background. You don't know that, right? You're having fun figuring out how many maces this dude should be wearing, right? But it's actually streaming the data and caching it to disk unbeknownst to you. So you continue playing through the game and to you it's a seamless experience. Somehow 40 gigs of data has appeared on my system. Sweet, right? And then you eventually get to the end of the trial and you have to pay money. But the point is that they allowed, they basically broke this barrier. Before, users couldn't try their game unless they went and bought it and waited for the four hour download time. Now users could try it immediately and move forward with it, right? Which brings me to the whole point of this diatribe for an HTML5 game developer class. You guys are generating a lot of assets. Most of your games are two-dimensional, which means you've got lots of textures, lots of sprites moving around on the screen, animations, glyphs, particle systems, sound files. This is a great statistic from the open web. 47% bounce rate if your page isn't loaded in three seconds, right? You can round that up and say 50% of your users will just abandon a website if, if it's not loaded in three seconds. If they don't see pixels on the screen, stuff moving around, they're gone, right? For game developers, this is actually pretty intense because for you to actually stream 25 megs to a user, that's going to take more than three seconds. Not counting all the other additional time that we've talked about in this course uh, time and time again about how long it actually takes to load that data into memory, process it into some sort of spatial data structure, and then put it on the screen after that. So this is actually a pretty big problem. There's many ways to solve it. Hopefully we've talked about a lot of them in the asset loading class as well as some of the other story time with Colt diatribes. I will tell you the one game that I think has the best chances of changing the way that game developers look at web game development. And that's actually a game called Realm of the Mad God. Anyone play this? I've spent way too much money playing this game. And if you're watching this on live or whatever, go spend that much money playing this game. It is worth your time, it's fantastic. Basically, Realm of the Mad God succeeds for a simple reason. It's an, it's an online, always persistent MMO. So you, you log in, you go shoot some stuff, you run around, you level up, you get some cool gear, you make a dwarf, it's awesome. The reason it succeeds is the entire game is 1.29 megs. Now that's not an initial load, that's the entire game is 1.29 megs, okay? That streams to you instantly. There is no wait time. There is no load time. It is there. Heck, I, I download images from ESPN.com that are larger than 1.29 megs, right? That thing takes like 20 seconds to load every time. So the point of this is that Realm of the Mad God developers actually came to the table from the beginning saying, we have to have less than two megabytes worth of client-side content. Otherwise, we're never actually gonna be able to pay to transfer all the bits from our servers to 10 to 15 million clients. 
we're not gonna make money. It's not gonna be able to break even because they didn't own their servers. They were on uh, scalable distributed networks and all these other things. So what I propose to you guys, now that you've been through eight weeks of this course and you've seen the underbelly of story time with Colt and you know what's out there ahead of you, as you start thinking about HTML5 game development, it should, you gotta stop thinking about the language and start thinking about the data. This has hopefully been the thing we've been harping on the whole time. It's all about data. Transferring data, caching data, acquiring data, answering phones with data. <laughs> That's okay. Anne came in late, so she didn't hear us talk about turning off our phones. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That's it. I'm done. That's all I had to say, actually. She's on the sound unit. She's on the sound unit. There you go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's right. So. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> any, any questions over my diatribe this evening? Uh, there's a microphone here. If you have questions, feel free to wander up and ask them. Story time with Colts. Hashtag story time with Colts. All right. I keep saying hashtag, and I feel like weird saying <laughs> yeah. that. Like, yeah. hashtag. I'm just going to shorten it. HT. That, that doesn't make it any better. Is that not any better? No, no it's okay. not any better. I lose that one. It really so. isn't. It's implied. <laughs> it's implied? Story time with Cole? Okay. D drop, drop the hashtag. It's cleaner. All right. So if you have any questions here in the room, uh, please jump up there for okay. our first there question. Go. Okay. Would there be any difference in the uh, bounce rate if a player was waiting for a 2D game versus a 3D game? Do they both have to load that quickly? They both have to load that quickly, absolutely. Um, and it gets even worse on mobile networks. So all of you guys in here, is that another cell phone? Are you you're playing? <laughs> playing okay. Realm of the Man God. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay. All right, that's all right. Yeah. She, she's doing. She's that's, doing. That's sorry. totally understandable. She's doing homework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So early start on the homework. There you go. <laughs> mobile, mobile networks actually have a worse problem. So anyone in, that's taking this class, trying to look at building HTML5 games because you want to bridge them over into mobile, right? Loading them in a web page, uh, you actually have a worse barrier because uh, if you've ever seen the talks by Ilya Grigoric or Steve Souders, you know that if the active radio connection on your cell phone has been idle for more than 60 seconds, you're going to have a 1,000 to 2,000 millisecond startup time for that phone to re-engage with the active mobile network if you're, on, if you're not on Wi-Fi and get that data off the net. That's two seconds you're already losing. So if a user tries to pull up your game and their radio connection has already been idle and they're not on Wi-Fi, you already lost two seconds of your load time. Yeah. That's what's really scary. You know? yeah. So when we talk about HTML5 gaming, we talk about it moving forward and, and sort of allowing us to branch out of the uh, digital distribution for these mobile networks, we have to take that into account, is that we're still fighting this data transfer and network speed problem. So that's, that's actually, in my opinion, one of the biggest barriers for HTML5 gaming moving forward. Yeah, speaking of that, so um, San Francisco HTML5 Meetup, um, definitely check out the recordings of this talk from Ilya. That was just uh, yeah. last month. It goes into Great that. talk where he goes into pretty all the de detail. Pretty good detail. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you don't if you don't follow Ilya, follow him. Follow him. It, it will change your view on developing web applications. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think he's also speaking at Velocity. You? So yeah. Yeah. once again, uh, SF HTML twenty for a coupon twenty percent off for that. All right. So let's get into the questions. Are there, if there are any questions here, um, we are giving you uh oh a great. We got swag. Oh yeah. Who was that question? Yeah. We, right there. We're gonna give you, you got swag. Question. Yeah. Swag for questions. So <laughs> you can pick out one of these. They have to be books. real questions. Yeah. yeah. They have to be real yeah. questions. Yeah. Anyway, we've got a book for you here. <laughs> I'm fully expecting someone to be like, how would you like those nachos? Give me a book. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to work. You can pick any of these yep. out. Pick one of pick those one. and yep. put the rest on there. All right. So no, no, no. He's, he's walking away. He's taking all of yeah. them. Yeah. You, you can put the other ones over there. Yeah. So um, <laughs> the question from uh, Sebas from Amsterdam. Uh, he's back. Can I modify the pixels of an image object before drawing it to the canvas? I've used get image data to modify pixel colors and then draw image again to canvas, but this is really inefficient and slows down the game. Let's see. So, well, the question whether you can do it is definitely, definitely yes, obviously. Uh, but that, Sebastian was already doing that. Um, any 
Any optimizations that you can think of? Yeah, so uh, my optimization that I would suggest is it sounds like you're doing a two-step process where you have one ca canvas A that you're calling get image data on and modifying and then drawing that canvas into section B. Obviously, you're going to add overhead for that middle step where you're locking the canvas and then copying that data. So because of the fact that the set image, the, once the get image data has been locked, that actually has to go through. And if you're in a hardware accelerated path, this actually has to do a blocking lock operation to the graphics API before it pushes that data to the GPU to be able to use. So typically what happens is you can, you can if you try to read from that data, you, you get blocked on that fence, right? You can't proceed any for, farther forward. What I would actually suggest as a speed up to this is actually lock your main canvas, right? So do all the drawing that you need to do, lock it at the end of the frame, go ahead and poke in the data into the main canvas where you would normally be modifying that data or more, normally be blitting that other image and then modify it there. Now, this will add extra overhead because remember, get image data has to call that blocking lock at the graphics API layer. That's the only way that the bits will actually be transferred to the GPU to actually be rasterized. So that's, that's going to be a slowdown. Um, from a meta level up, definitely ask yourself whether or not that, that information is needed and what it's adding to your value. Like, if, if you're losing five milliseconds a frame doing you know, five little particles shooting off an emitter, uh, you, should, you should seriously weigh how much your artistic quality versus frame budget <laughs> is. All right. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Next question from Lucas from Lublin. That sounds like a place where they play lubstep. Lubstep. I like lobster. Yeah, I like lobster. Yeah, I, like I like little cat on the keyboard. Yeah. Lobster's yeah, right there. Good, yeah. We should we should, should have, have we should have them live DJ tonight. Yeah, that's right. We should, we we'll should do have. some live DJ set after the show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can I make changes to the game made for the contest if it's already submitted on the forum? Yes. Yeah. Uh, especially send. since you know the deadline has been yeah, extended. Yeah, exactly. So, so we give you yeah. a little extra time. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, Lucas, uh, definitely send a quick email to. Sean Bennett over here. Or um, sure. what, what you can do instead. <laughs> or, or Peter Lubbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, thank you, Peter. <laughs> what, what you can do instead is just edit uh, your post on the forum and add that information. It's like, I originally submitted it on this date, and I have changed this and this and this. Just add it to your forum post. That, that's perfectly yeah. fine. OK. Perfect. Mm. <clears throat> All right. Uh, from Flays, one of our top question. Mm. Uh, I forget where it's from. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there about game programming, drawing, level creation, that sort of thing. But actual game design seems like a difficult subject to teach. Hmm. How can one get better at game design? Wow. Um, that's, well, that's a large first question. thing I, that comes to mind is a blog post by Colt from about a week ago. Which with one was Great that? resources. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, by popular request, Colt actually put together a G++. A G++, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, with all of those. And mm -hmm. that's been reshared quite a bit, actually, uh, I know. Mm -hmm. so I think, I think yeah. it's actually my, my most popular G++ right. post of right. all time, like yeah. Yeah. 350 reshares, which for me is like amazing. Content is king. Content yeah. is king, that's yeah. right. Um, so so uh, a I, lot of those deal with game programming. Programming, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. yeah. So um, I spent four or five years actually teaching at SMU Guildhall, a video, which is a video game development school that's associated with Southern Methodist University. So you can actually get your graduate degree there uh, in game design or game programming or game art. Um, I worked a lot with a lot of the design department because I wanted to make sure that our programming curriculum was actually serving the needs of the design department. The, the best advice I can give you if you want to be better at game design is actually to break down, much like programming, is break down what those games are doing and try to turn it into a, a flow diagram. Right? There's, there's actually a fantastic blog out there that does this. I forget the name of it, but they'll actually break down the monetization strategies for mobile games. And they'll be like, here is how Angry Birds actually makes money. Right? And here, here is how Twin Tribes actually makes money. And they actually break it down and say, here's the gimmick, here's the reflow. And they actually turn it into these, these nice terms. Um, the, the, best design I, the best stuff I can give you is write a lot. Story, 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 story. Read even more than you write. Story, 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 story. And then from there, go through, analyze your competition, figure out what they're doing, and constantly try to proof it out in some easy little uh, prototyping language. Go download Unity. Go download ImpactJS. Just, just try your stuff. Try your data. Just make, make it and iterate on it and fail. Fail horribly. Fail so much that you get bald and jaded and, and, <laughs> and have to stand on the internet all day ranting. Just fail and fail and fail. It, it will make you amazing as a game designer. Um, 
uh, just to continue this diatribe, one of the courses I taught at SMU was how to get a job in the games industry. Uh, this was actually like the capstone class that I <laughs> love to teach there. And, and basically I would put these students through through a cheese grinder mm -hmm. for you know six to eight weeks where basically I would just drill them. And the thing that it kept coming back to, and my, these students would email me after they would go through the ringer and actually get their job, is they would come back and say, you know, when I was in the interview, I was able to talk about stuff that no one else in the room was able to talk about. And the whole reason they did that was that I kept forcing them to iterate, 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 go out and, and try to mimic what these people were doing, break down their game, redo the design, get more data, spend all of your day and all of your night obsessing about your goal. If you want to make games, that's your goal. Anything else you're doing is standing in the way. Well, you know, except for life. Life's important too, I suppose. Um, but yeah, <laughs> you're getting better design, it's, it's a tough path. Quick, uh, quick add or question to that. You mentioned the monetization website. Do you mm -hmm. think you could look that up and we could add that to Absolutely. the next course email? Absolutely. Because yes. that would be fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great. It's a, it blows my mind. Yeah, I yeah. 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 Caps for this course. Uh, questions? Yeah, please. So I apologize up front if uh, if uh, you guys have already answered this in a previous class that I missed or something, but. Uh, I was looking at a lot of the different tile sets and stuff that are out there for you know free resources mm. for people to pick up on, and a lot of the different places have these tile sets, but none of them seem to have an associated sheet that talks about how the tile sets are broken out into coordinates. Mm -hmm. So is there like some magic I'm missing, or do people just pull up Photoshop and start dragging coordinates and making their own lists? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, like the tile tool that we have for this class, like it does that and it spits it out in mm -hmm. JSON. It's nice, but. Are these things they just say, ha, here's the picture, we're not going to give you all the numbers and, you know, go suffer? Or is there something else out there? Um, and yeah. That, so most of the stuff you get for free is not super uber high quality. Sure. Sure. Or, or they uh, will align themselves to uh, grids, like regular grids, and assume that you understand that if this thing takes four by four. Okay. Um, but they're, they're, most of the people, if, if it's any more complex than that, they go in and they just drag coordinates through the okay. process, unfortunately. Um, what, what I do for a lot of my prototyping stuff is I actually uh, use the uh, tiles from the, uh, I think it's Lost Tree, uh, David yeah. Dave Ederly, I think it is. His, his stuff is really top notch. It's, it, you get an SVG format or PNG or uh, even Swift format. And I think he had like a Silverlight version a while ago, back when Silverlight was actually a thing. Um, yeah, but, but I, use, I use his stuff or I actually just go rip them from other games and just use them for prototyping. Okay. So. That's what I was doing. I was just wondering if there was a better solution. Yeah. So, thank yeah. you. <laughs> wild, wild west. All right. Is there too much overhead to use exceptions in game development? What happens under the hood in try-catch blocks? Mm. And Colts talk about arrays was pure gold. I'd love something like that on exceptions or a pointer to that kind of info from Enroll, Port Townsend, Washington. Awesome. Uh, first off, thank you. Uh, Golden Arrays was, was the, actually the name of my master's thesis. No, okay. Also your rock band. <laughs> also my rock band, yeah. goldenarrays.com. Um, <laughs> Golden earring. <laughs> so, uh, they're, they're, so the problem with try-catch blocks is that we really don't have a good understanding of how to handle errors correctly in JavaScript. I think that's one of the fundamental problems is mm -hmm. there, there's really no yeah. good reporting structure. No, you know, like, hey, an error has occurred, throw it up to a server so I can get it in my logs. Um, so I will tell you this, uh, probably one of the most important things about try-catch blocks is that any code inside of the try-catch block that's resident in that function will not be optimized. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. So any code inside that try-catch block will not be optimized. Now, if you actually take that code, spit it out into a leaf function, and call that leaf function from the try-catch block, the leaf function can get optimized on its own. These are, these are subtle nuances on how every JavaScript virtual machine handles these sorts of items. The problem is, is that in optimizing your code and making it an inline path or a fast path, it actually removes a lot of the type data as well as call stack data from the actual function itself. So if a crash were to occur in there, the, v, the uh, underlying VM would just be like, Whoa, I, th I think a dog just hit a tree. Like it, ha it has no idea what's going on, right? So basically what they try to do is they say, hey, anything that's co-resident in the same scoping variable as this try-catch block will actually not yield any efficient code. Mm -hmm. So because of this, I highly recommend don't wrap anything you need important inside of try-catch blocks. Try to push that as far down the stack into leaf functions as possible. Make sure that you treat um, try-catch exceptions as though they were conditional statements. I think that's the best computer science way to approach it, right? So put it, put it in a function, nest it way down deep, depending on, make it actually return a valid value, 
out of the function or something that you know bubbles up through the hierarchy that, that makes sense. But don't just you know wrap your entire code in a try catch because then nothing will get optimized and it'll be crazy. Yeah, cool. All right. Any questions in the room? <coughs> if you have questions, we are handing out these nice yeah. O'Reilly yeah. yeah. papers. Oh, let's go. <laughs> Mean time to Tony. No Hold flag. on. Forty one. No flag today. Mean time to Tony. So the original intent of this course was to emphasize some capabilities in HTML5. It's also a free course from Udacity. And uh, I, I learned a lot from this course, but I didn't have a chance to write as much code as I'd want to. So I have a, a suggestion that perhaps um, there's a point in the course where something like a reference architecture could be put together. And it really doesn't matter whether you learn through the course or whether you learn from a reference architecture, I think they would both have the same purpose. What I might do in the future is watch all the videos on the course and then jump to a reference architecture document that picks up in say unit six or something. And what, what this reference architecture in this context might be is a couple of objects that were loaded from, you know, from maps and atlases colliding almost like a pong game and even things like the last question, exceptions, where would you use them? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's a suggestion at the end of this course to say that this is, I think, a follow-on uh, to the learning might be saying, if I want to do something well in a canvas in HTML5, if I started with this, I'm going to be doing the best I can. So it's just a, uh, it's my post-mortem, you know, on, on taking this course for eight weeks. And I really do appreciate all I've, I've learned, even though I've been too busy to kind of like <laughs> put a lot of it into practice. Something like that might say, the next time I think of putting something in my business app in a canvas, here's where I'm going to start. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. So thank you, yeah. Tony. Yeah. Take one of the books yeah. and pass one to your. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That question. Previous question. <laughs> yeah. That's oh. a great, great suggestion. In fact, yeah. um, this was suggested uh, by several people, uh, including the person sitting behind you. <laughs> um, I think I think that's a great idea, and I think uh, we're actually getting some offers of help for this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's certainly not like like one of the things I wanted to mention also is like we, we've been talking about this. This is our final study group, right? But the course is not going away. No. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. The course is staying. Uh, yeah. Tell your friends about it. And we are continue, going to continue to improve it as well. And mm -hmm. so some of those ideas are very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. uh, probably I will also be sending you a, a quick survey uh, with some ideas and definitely uh, post it there as well. So. No, I think you've covered it great. <laughs> it's very, well, we, we need to be very clear, though. The course will go on. There will just be less free food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the free food will not go on. <laughs> so, a, as a follow-up to the post-mortem, I, I did ask Peter this question earlier, but uh, since you haven't brought it up, when is the 3D course coming up? Because that's the one that uh, I think we all want to do as the follow-on to this course. Mm, 3D course. That's right. Okay. Well, I mean, th there is actually a, a 3D course up on Udacity. Have you seen um, that one? Called... Uh, Interactive rendering, no 3D rendering. I'm sorry, um, and it's taught by Eric, Eric Haynes. Haynes, who is uh, Eric the Haynes man. is uh, <laughs> is is the definitive source in graphics rendering right now. He has he publishes a fantastic book called Real Time Rendering that's like that thick. It's in its third volume. Any graphics programmer I've ever worked with in the games industry has a copy of his book sitting on their desk at all times. So uh, Eric Haynes knows mm -hmm. his stuff. If you want to yeah. know anything about 3D, he's the guy to go to. Yeah, absolutely. So the and that's for you know actually doing cool. 3D rendering, uh, interactive 3D rendering. Um, it doesn't cover game development, no, but right. all the techniques that you would that's use you're talking about. for game <laughs> development. And of course, yeah, I'm interested in the next games. Yeah. Uh, I got it. Right. We'll talk. We'll talk. We'll huddle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm hoping that in the next few weeks or so, we will be able to at least give you a heads up on when our next uh, effort is mm -hmm. going to kick off. We're yep. definitely talking about it a lot. Don't have any specific dates for you just quite yet, but uh, something we're very actively discussing right now. Yeah, so. very much so. Yeah. Okay, um, did you get a book? No. Okay, mm -hmm. right. so a uh, question from Flays. Here, just take Flays. one of these Flays. <laughs> there you go. And you just leave, them, leave the other one there next to the. You can hand it to the next one. 
next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can a canvas pattern fill style be scaled without also scaling the shape that is used to draw it? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. An off-screen canvas mm. has the problem of sometimes being prohibitively large and oh, always having integer dimensions. Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know off dimensions, hand, but I'm not. Sure. I guess I'm not sure which, what's meant by integer dimensions. So, so basically, well, the fill pattern. Basically, yeah. it sounds like he's wanting to draw an arbit arbitrarily shaped polygonal entity right. uh -huh. with uh, like yeah. a path right. with a fill style that can scale inside of that mm -hmm. path. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's going to be tricky. Uh, it, it can be. So so uh, there's not a direct API to do what you're asking. Uh, however, I'm, I'm sure that by this point you've investigated the concepts of you know, uh, drawing this into, so drawing your fill pattern into something mm -hmm. and then actually setting your, the path that you're rendering into as a, as a clipping region. Mm -hmm. So you can actually set that as a clipping region and then what happens is you draw that clipping region against your, fill, your, your other canvas that's actually been tiled properly and, uh, or you know, even if it's just a small rectangle and this will give you the effect of filling that shape with that fill style. Uh, definitely check out the clip path, clip rect, uh, those APIs inside of Canvas. That, that's going to lead you where you want to go with that one. Again, you're going to have to do a little ping pong, fill, and then set, and then render, but it'll work, I think. Yeah. Patent pending. <laughs> all right, so this is more of a comment. Thanks for running the course, guys. I'm sure you have all, um, uh, we have all learned a lot, and I have enjoyed the lessons. Story time with Colt. <laughs> it's the you. hashtag and the highlight. Uh, I gotta, thank you very much, Martin. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to say this is that, that uh, these, these two guys here have actually done more work than I have in this entire course. Um, the, all the heavy lifting of, of taking the rambling madness that is my head and actually turning it into a usable course that you know over 60,000 people have had the benefit of, of being influenced with has been really good. So if anybody deserves credits, these guys right here. So thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a, another question from the forum, and if you have a question here, just jump to the mic. Um, no, Brom, no one's interested now that the books are gone. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> there's, there's one more book. Oh, there's, there's one we left. Stickers. Yeah. We have stickers. No. Yeah. Yeah. T-shirts. Yeah. T-shirts. Yep. That's right. Um, Bram from Belgium. So what would be the best method to store assets like music offline in a lot of browsers? Mm. Or do we need to support different uh, technologies for different yeah. browsers if we want to do that? <laughs> also, is there going to be an exam? I might have missed that info. So uh, let me start with the last question. So there's not really an official exam at the end, but um, you still have a week to do the contest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The true exam. Yeah. Um, That's more important than any actual <coughs> exam you're going to do. Tests? <laughs> Paper? Yeah. Actually building something. Right. It's way more important. Um, but <laughs> let's come back to the question. The, the first part, the, uh, the storing of assets. Um, so there are a variety of things available in modern browsers, including uh, application cache, mm -hmm. which has you know, limits in, in various browsers. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is, to, to bypass a lot of that, people use uh, local storage, mm -hmm. session storage, local storage. Yeah. That's also very limited because of the size that you can put things in. The music, obviously, uh, being pretty big. Um, so there's a if you really want to go back far, like in, in old versions of IE, uh, you're going to be hitting some walls pretty quickly with, uh, with like local storage and things like that. Um, different browsers also implement application cache limits differently. So for example, in Chrome, you can actually store quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually some work ongoing right now on uh, a sort of an upgrade to the application cache. Mm -hmm. Um, specification that's pretty promising. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've seen some of the early work and, and it's all publicly available. That's uh, quite exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, more of like programmatic access and things like that are being spec'd out. But yeah, other than that, you're going to need, it's going to be painful to store yeah. lots of music. Yeah, storing, storing assets client side right now is fairly fragmented, to, to put it lightly. Um, there are three or four different technologies that everyone's using. You need to polyfill for all of these different technologies. Yeah. Um, IndexedDB is another one. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Um, that. that would also work well, um, but again, also has limits. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it, if you want to support anything past you know, the modern browsers, really, it's, it's going to be a little painful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
Well, that's a great lead into my next question, uh, and that is, what's the most like uh, efficient way to to make your music run? And I and I saw you uh, with the example that you gave of the MMO. If you got some really you know really funky music that you're putting in, which is you know what I want is to really have a real nice uh, pr sound production inside the game to really give it a wallop. What's the most efficient way to get that done? Mm. I know that's a big question, yeah. but like to, you know, if you want the music to, to load, you know, without any problems and you want it to be efficient and you want it to be, you know, rapid, what would you suggest? So, so I have a follow up question there is, are you looking for this, this data to be pre-baked, right? So the asset, the asset creation process is someone is recording the riffs, putting through a processing tool, generating an AUG or an MP3, and then that's going into the system? Or are you expecting you know, the riffs to be recorded and then some mixing tool like Acid, Reflow, or something like that, actually s you spit out what the timeline would be as data, and then you load each of the riffs as well as the timeline into the game? Which, which path are you looking to do? Uh, you know, I, honestly, the first path is, is the one that's going to be know. most effective for me. But I would like to have a, some elaboration on both. Uh, well, probably the web audio APIs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, have you tried the grits? Uh, like, uh, what did you think of that? Like the way that it loads music almost instantly. And then I think that's a good approach. Yeah. But I want to. I want to be sure that I have a couple of alternatives. Hmm. Ah, okay. So I don't think you're probably going to do any better than web audio, most likely. Um, I, I mean, that's really the state of the art. Aud yeah. Audio in the web right now is still very much uh, being worked on. Uh, the uh, only other real alternative is going to be the audio tag, which yeah. Yeah, it's broken. is broken, basically. So, so I'll <laughs> say this, is uh, let, let's compare and contrast ecosystems here. So if you're writing a sound manager library for a native application, let's say using C++, um, typically the big burden there is how do we get this four megabyte sound file into memory and then the amount of time it takes to decompress subsections of that, M of that sound file into something that the audio processing convention can actually run with, right? So that's where you're going to be losing a lot of your time there as well as your mental bandwidth because understanding how to properly move that sliding window around and decompressing some of those streamed setups uh, that's, you're going to lose a lot of time there trying to get that right. And especially there's differences when you've got like a 10 minute MP3 versus like, uh, you know, uh, something that's fire and forget. So you lose a lot there. Now, once you have that architecture, then you actually start building the game components on it where you actually start using it, you know, just go play the sound, let it loop, you know, what happens when I finish, things along those lines. The, the interesting part about the HTML5 platform and the web audio tag is all of that underlying stuff about streaming, buffering, decompression, that's all handled for you. So that, that's, all off your plate. Uh, you can't really get more efficient than what they're doing because they're already taking all that streaming into account, which again, that's, that's the part you have to worry about is how, how far forward you're fetching your window, how far you're streaming your data. I mean, uh, we're not even gonna get into talking to talk about the differences, differences in uh, sample frequency between platforms, right? And, and making sure that you get an accurate tick over time, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're running on a Windows <laughs> machine, you actually get a slower sound reference tick than on a Mac or a Linux box, which means you have to resample all of your sounds to actually run a dip different frequency. That's just madness. Right? Yeah, I'm trying to avoid all that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, stick with the web audio API. It's, it's going to get you 99.9% .9 of that right there. Yeah, 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 actually, that's a good um, thing from Tony. Uh, check out Chris Wilson's uh, mm. great talks on mm -hmm. either HTML5 DevConf. He just did a great uh, presentation that was recorded, I'm pretty sure. Uh, also, from even from last year from I.O., that's probably one of the all-time greatest videos on, on web audio. So Chris Wilson yeah. videos. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, when should the development of a game be finished? There's <laughs> always something to add or change, but the game has to be released someday. And what do you, uh, what do you think about changing the game after it's published? Uh, zeros. I was asking that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm a very good question. <laughs> I'm a massive advocate of the lean entrepreneur setup for this, which is that you ship early, you iterate, you get feedback, and you change your game. Uh, and then in that methodology, your game's never done. The game that people are playing and paying for, that's just the thing that you had the most time to do up to that point. Um, if you look anywhere in games industry development, AAA games or whatever, and you constantly ask them, 
you know, could your game been better? They would be like, yeah, if we had another year. And then a year later, they're like, well, of course, if we had another year. Uh, it's not the best game that ships, it's the game that ships when time ran out. And by adopting sort of this lean entrepreneur, ship early, ship often, iterate model, you're actually getting rid of all that fluff. You're getting your, your product out to the consumers, you're testing the waters, you're figuring out if it's gonna fail or succeed, you're figuring out whether or not you need to spend another $20 million investing in it, or if it was just a bad idea and you need to go back to the board. You can't, th that, iter that iteration and that information is so valuable that, that I highly recommend going there. Whatever you have, ship it today, get feedback. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, question for you. Yeah. So how soon will the unit tests for sound manager be fixed, particularly those related to load async? Starting with quiz four and continuing, mm. con continuing to the end of the unit, the test for load async fails for many, apparently due to a timing issue. They are stuck. Yeah, um, a few people are running into this. I'm actually stuck having a hard result. time reproducing it on my machine. There are some race conditions that should have been fixed when I talked to someone about it earlier today, uh, but it seems like it only fixed uh, the initial load async, at least for them. Uh, and it's still, we're still trying to figure out what exactly the race condition is in there. Um, I'm hopefully going to be able to fix that sometime early tomorrow. Oh, okay. That's, that's my goal. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Question from Ann. Yeah, since it's the last one and you can say that you can't, you can't answer that this, this is fine too, but I'll see what you can say. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, for HTML5, I mean, a couple of years ago it was, really painful as, as far as the performance and things like that. And I kind of told people, well, you know, Flash was that way when it started. It was absolutely awful and then and then got better. And there has been some improvement. Um, I'm wondering if you looked in ahead a bit, and obviously there's been some huge news about both Chrome and Firefox going in and, and gutting some of their engines and redoing things. Positive development, please, for HTML5 and, and speed on the web. Um, is that is is that far enough to look ahead, or um, or is it going to be like maybe some vendors like <coughs> Apple, where they <laughs> where they they basically handicap handicap the web so that the the native apps can have the big the mm. big uh, foot up? Any um, any thought on how Google or or Firefox are going to you know where they're and it usually boils down to money as far as where a company's making money as far as what they want to make a good experience. Um, so that and WebGL is my other question. Mm -hmm. Obviously we're seeing some movement, some exciting movement finally from Microsoft on that. And uh, uh, right now you've still got to flip a flag in, in Android on, on yeah. Chrome and mm -hmm. thoughts on the future of any, any of that that you can talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's definitely something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, this, this is all you. This is all you. Well, I think uh, definitely very exciting uh, news. I mean, it, it's no doubt going to be good for performance to have you know different uh, people working together uh, and, and you know figuring this out. But um, I think there's a really good blog post from uh, Arrow Twist. It's actually um, Paul Lewis who ha have written a nice article on how this will, uh, the, the Blink announcement will affect performance. Definitely uh, urge you to check that one out. Um, as far as WebGL is concerned, I think, I mean, the way I look at it is always, um, you know, two years ago or maybe three years ago now, I mean, we were looking at things like the audio tag, the video tag, Canvas, those were really the only three things that were pretty fully baked in HTML5. And all these other things like you know, web sockets, uh, there was like no browser that supported that in 2008. And then end of 2009 came this little bit of support. And now fast forward just a few years later and you have did in every browser, right? So I think it's just a matter of time. So all the, the new and really exciting stuff we're talking about now, you know, give it a year or two, and it's just going to be commonplace, right? And there's always going to be that next thing. But I think, you know, when it comes to WebGL, that's, you know, that came really much later, and it's already um, in a lot of browsers and a lot of good support for that. So I, I keep keeping a, a positive approach. To <laughs> <laughs> Anything to add to that? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how do you feel about WebGL? 
Do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, follow, follow up for that. So, if we want to write the game, which would run on as many platforms as we could get, so which technology could we use now, or should, or should not use? It's <laughs> a great question. Um, I, I will have to tell you this: in, in my short time at Google, that is the most dominant question I've received. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of confusion in the developer community right now about what the real future is. And I think a lot of individuals look to large platform holders like Google and Apple and Firefox um, to, to kind of try to pave the way. And, and the problem is that uh, I, I, have trouble, I personally have trouble answering this question because uh, like I have personal bias and then I have like pragmatic bias as well as evangelical bias. Right, and so uh, the the personal bias is that I, I think that um, I think that there's a lot of bumpy roads ahead for every technology, and that leads you into the pragmatic advice, which is that uh, we're doing so much cross compilation now that there's really no reason to actually change languages. I mean, think about it, guys. We can take C plus plus to JavaScript, C plus plus to C sharp, C plus plus to Python. We can take Python to JavaScript. JavaScript to C++, like we can go every direction now, especially if you look at the Hacks project, H-A-X-E. Hacks, in my opinion, is one of the coolest things out there uh, because Hacks allows you to write in some meta language and it's built into the architecture that the whole point of the language is to output it in other languages. So you write in Hacks and compile it and say, oh, by the way, give me C++ code, right? Give me JavaScript code, give me Objective-C code. So it's really the concept of write your code in one language and get all these other platforms. And now there's tons of problems there too because what you're really asking is how do I write an efficient, well-performing program that can interface with each of these platforms in the right way? And this comes to the evangelical advice, which is that uh, you're, you're not going to be able to write once and run anywhere no matter what. Not because of the technology, because of the differences in form factors between each of the platforms. Expecting to write something that runs great with touch on a, on a, on a, a pro profile screen that works in that methodology, that works on this small resolution, and then put it in a web page, you're going to have to redo all your UI. You have to redo your loading scenarios, and then try to take that and put it on Steam or Xbox 360. You can run into tons and tons of different problems. So the evangelical advice there is that it, it doesn't exist not because of a technology problem, because you have to seriously think about the, the experience of the product on each of the platforms. And that's what the big barrier is, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> one more, because one of the cross-platform technologies that doesn't get mentioned, but if you really look at any platform out there, um, if we look at OpenGL ES, mm -hmm. it's probably at the heart the most prevalent thing, which is one of the reasons I ask about WebGL, because the big problem with just saying, okay, just go open GLES and then have a little bit of native and that's is, that's a beautiful, fast cross-platform approach and, and knowing C++ myself also, it's like, mm, mm, that's very attractive. Mm. Um, issue with that has always been how do you get that easily to, to the web. Um, so that's another thing with the WebGL. I mean, you could export it to JavaScript, but then you can't really get that way. So I just don't see a total cross-platform solution either way. I mean, you could, you could say if you're high performance, then absolutely go OpenGL, yes. And if you don't have to be, then, then probably the most cross-platform approach is HTML5, CSS3, and, and, and friends. Um, thoughts on that if you're a developer? Yeah, so again, I, I think this comes to the pragmatic discussion of like, what is your goal, what is your aim, right? I mean, if, if, uh, if you're writing a two-dimensional game, um, then, then yeah, there, I mean, you're not going to need all these high performance primitives, so it makes absolute sense to write something in HTML5 or hacks or something like that because you're going to get great performance pretty much anywhere. I mean, especially yeah. with Chrome 26, you get great canvas performance. Yeah, that that wasn't paper. even true a year ago, but yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. 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 And, and right. so, you know, give us another year, like Peter said, and things change even more. Now, if you're going to come to the table with a million lines of C++ code already sitting around because of a startup or some other, you know, libraries that you had, and you're going to try to adapt that to the web, well, now you're going to run into some interesting questions about performance, about what your end goal is. If you're just trying to target web on desktop, you've got awesome technologies like Native Client or maybe even Asm.js if you're going for that other route. 
Uh, if you're trying to get that back into mobile, then you have to start looking at an script in, and then seriously ask yourself about whether or not uh, ARM processors are going to be able to actually pull the wattage to compete with x86. Uh, which, fun fact, uh, and we actually talked about this at the at the uh, EdgeConf in London, was that uh, I actually talked with a, a company who had an ARM emulator that was running ARM on x86 faster than ARM executes on ARM. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so let that sink in for a minute, right? X86 has had 30 years of wattage and conversion and tooling to make sure that it just does nothing but crunch numbers as fast as possible. ARM was never built that way. ARM was built to be low wattage first. And so we already have this massive performance gap between these two because they're serving different masters. And so I think any developer has to come to the table and actually say, what am I actually trying to accomplish here? Uh, that's, that's the most pragmatic advice I can give everyone. I will, I will go blue in the face before I advocate for one technology as dominant. I think you have to, you have to look in your mirror and, and ask yourself what you're making. Okay. Sorry. So we got about that time. I tried. Three, it's almost, we're out of time, but it's we the have- last episode. Let's get okay. a couple more questions. You guys don't got to work somewhere to be? Any in the yeah. audience, let me know. Yeah. Um, are there any build libraries to pass variables from JavaScript to Python? Kind of almost in line with what you were just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I keep yeah. hearing about Ajax and its compatibility issues. Is there anything else we could use? Would it be possible to get a quick example of it? Um, this, from this is almost yeah. This is almost too vague. We don't know if you're running a client side application, a server side application. If you're talking about communicating from JavaScript in the browser to Python running on App Engine, mm -hmm. or if you're talking about like a VM running on a local machine, uh, feel free to send me an email. Well, I'll, hap I'll be happy to answer this offline. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Two questions. The JVM does escape analysis that allows it to sometimes allocate temporary objects such as iterators, vectors, closures, etc., on the stack instead of the heap. Mm. Uh, can V8 and other JS engines perform this kind of analysis? Yes. Yes, and it does. Um, the 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 dark magic that goes under the hood goes on under the hood of a JavaScript virtual machine boggles my mind. Um, and a lot of the times, some of the things that I come to the table with, with my years of performance analysis, is actually counterintuitive, right? Like things I expect from the C++ world and every other language that's like, hey, sometimes manual inlining is the best way to get performant code, is actually counterproductive in most of these JavaScript VMs because it goes against the grain of how their sort of polling analysis works internally. Um, yeah, this is one of the big problems we're struggling with Perf Squad is how do you actually tell people to write performant code mm -hmm. with a system that kind of moves around and has all these heuristics to handle all these different use cases. It's, it's actually a problem to communicate, right? That's, yeah. yeah. So, you're going to write a book, Colt? Uh, I think it's a good idea. Um, I, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know if there's enough demand for it. Um, I think that's my question. If you feel that there is demand for a book about game development, feel free to email me. I would love support to figure out whether or not it's, it's actually worth the time. There's tons of data. I think there's a great place to be out there. I think there's tons of information. I'd love to be a part of something like that. But if, if, if anything, I think it should be called Storytime with Colt. Storytime yeah. with Colt? Yeah. That's oh, that would be great. Be. That's oh. what the title should and be. And we could, we could do it. Like, that would be the like, hashtag Storytime with Colt. And then in the book, you would get yeah. the little call out of me being like, <laughs> <laughs> right, and then it would have like some crazy story about the games oh, industry. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Oh, yeah, that would be amazing. I think we've got a hit on our hands. <laughs> read, read that to my kids. Yeah. <laughs> Before you yes. read the last question, yeah. this is my reference architecture question reframed here, because essentially, if you get rid of the testing code and everything like that, you right. might be able to pull something like this. Mm -hmm. Which is the final question, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot more code uh, from Scott. Lawrence in San Francisco. Um, there's a lot more code in the index HTML5 grids. Um, what's the best for a way for us to fill in the gaps to understand mm. what's happening to even get the game started? So uh, one of the things is, yeah, so um, we're definitely talking about how we can make some of these reference examples. Mm -hmm. Like ideally we'd have like something to check out for each, uh, each step of the way. Think, right, exactly. But the, the code for grids is out there, right? So I hope that's, that mm -hmm. was clear. Um, you can actually grab all of that. And one of the best ways, is, as Colt mentioned earlier, is to really try to play around with this stuff and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and look at that code, really try to understand it, and play around with it. Um, anything to add to that? No, I think that's great. Um, I think that actually digging in and trying to understand something that, mm -hmm. you know, you feel kind of lost when you first wade in is... <laughs> Especially when you look at my code. <laughs> you can say it, say it. No, say no, it. I'll, say it. I'll refrain. All right. I'll, I'll refrain. 
uh, <laughs> is a great way to learn anything. We're off the air. Um, <laughs> <it's> oh. <laughs> uh, I, I think you learn more when you kind of throw yourself in there than any other time. And I think that's part of what Colt is getting at so, so often when he says just, you know, just dive into whatever games that you, that you want to learn how, how they're made. Just dive in and see how it runs. Ma see what makes it tick. And that is where you really learn. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So are there any other questions in the audience? Going okay. once. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank every one of you for coming, especially the ones that have been here every yeah. one yeah. of the single of uh, eight weeks. Yeah. That's been <laughs> great getting to know you. Mm -hmm. um, looking forward to judging the contest and kind of sad to say that we won't be back next week, so yeah. don't, don't show up here today. Yeah, there's no free food here. <laughs> there's, there's no more free food. <laughs> um, <laughs> what we are, what I was thinking about, and I haven't talked to Sean and Colt yet, is maybe in a month or, you know, in some period of time, maybe not a month is probably not great because of Google I.O., but maybe yeah, sometime that's a bad after I.O., <laughs> just to do another, um, sort of like an online live event on Google Developers Live. Just where people can ask their questions for, and then we can give a couple of updates and mm -hmm. talk about the contest and things like that. But mm -hmm. we'll probably be doing that from the Mountain View mm -hmm. GDL studio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, thanks everyone can for. I can I say one last thanks? Yes, yes. Yeah. of course. Um, I do have to say this. Thank you all so much for your continued support in this class. It has been humbling, <laughs> absolutely humbling. Yeah. The amount of support, the feedback, the attention to detail, and the dedication that all the students put in this class. I honestly have to say I learned so much just from getting the feedback from all the students. Thank you guys so much mm -hmm. for allowing us into your minds and, and the ability to influence your lives. It is, it is humbling that you've trusted us with that. So thank you so much. I wish you nothing but best. Go on, make amazing things, dedicate yourself to doing awesome, and you're going you're gonna to achieve it. I have faith in you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> all right. With that, we're... I'm going to close it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. All right. See ya. <laughs>